Guten Nachmittag. Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you all to the debate this afternoon on post-tsunami aid. What is human life worth? Aid after the disaster. How much is a human life worth? It's nearly exactly a month ago that this incredible, terrible, and serious disaster hit Asia and killed more than 160,000 people, has made more than 5 million people dependent on aid. So there's the disaster on the one hand, and on the other hand, this overwhelming reaction and response of people from all over the world, uh, this wonderful mobilization to provide aid. Considerable amounts have been collected. Governments reacted quickly. But also the population in numerous countries have responded as never, ever before in the face of this cataclysm. I must say I was also surprised by what Switzerland provided. I went on to the website of the Swiss uh, chain of aid and for Switzerland, the astounding amount of $195 million was collected and raised. I also heard this morning in the news that there's going to be a UN appeal for Africa, and I'm going to be very curious to see what the response will be. You know that there's this new catchphrase of the silent tsunami or tsunamis, to which we respond more or less generously and more or less rapidly. So this is the general context in which we will have the debate this afternoon. As you will have seen in the program of the forum, we have the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Afghanistan, Mr. Abdullah Abdullah, on my right, on my left, I beg your pardon. Then next to him, Next to Mr. Fust, I beg your pardon, the Finance Minister of South Africa, Mr. Trevor Manuel. Then to my right, Mrs. Ogata, the lady whom we all remember well as the High Commissioner of the UN, now back in Japan, working as the President of the Japan International Cooperation Agency. And then from the Director General of Switzerland, of Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation, Mr. Walter Fust, and then Corinne Honshaw from the Church's Development Aid Organization in Switzerland, and then from the International Federation of the Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies, Mr. Marcus, Mr. Marco Niskala, and then from the private sector, Disaster Resource Network in Geneva, as far as I know, this is an organization which was founded in response to a disaster which also happened more or less just on the eve of a forum, annual forum meeting. And then from the DHL, we have Uwe Dorken, the general manager. So there are a lot of us up here on the podium. It's quite crowded. And this is probably an expression of how much we were affected by this uh, disaster and also the wonderment of the response, the general response, the worldwide response after the disaster. How are we going to organize the debate? First of all, I'll put some questions to the people from the South, the finance minister from South Africa and to the Foreign Affairs Minister of Afghanistan. Then in a second round, I'd like to ask what the situation is now after this first month of the first reaction of first aid. Obviously, we cannot describe the situation in detail in the hardest hit countries and areas in India, in Sri Lanka and Indonesia. But 
at least we should have some idea of what is happening now in these areas. And then questions to the private sector. What is your function? What, how do you see your role now that this first phase has been concluded? And then rep the questions to the representatives of the development aid and aid agencies from two countries, how they see their work and what needs to be done in the next stage. You know that in Japan, in Kobe, a conference was held on disaster reduction, that is a how to, prov to reduce the damage once there has been a disaster, what can be done in terms of prevention, warning systems, and so on and so forth. So much for my introduction. I have a request to you. Before you leave the hall at the end of the debate, please complete the form which you found on your chair before you sat down and return it also to the organizers at the door so that we know from you what your judgment is of the organization of this debate and of the meeting in general. I'm sure you'll have the occasion as well and the opportunity to put questions and contribute to the discussion. So the purpose is not to have a discussion only amongst the panelists. So first of all, my question to Mr. Manuel. I just said a moment ago that I heard in the news today that the UN has launched an appeal to help Africa. And you have, I'm sure, also heard this catchphrase of the silent tsunamis. What did you feel when you heard about the disaster in Southeast Asia? And what did you feel also in the follow-up? And what do you feel about this concept of the silent tsunamis? And what do you feel about this appeal for aid for Africa? Thank you, Marcus. Thank you, Marcus. Whatever, whatever the objective might be of, of what brings us to Davos, it's important to recognize that in the context of the tsunami, in the countries affected, lives were lost. Families destroyed, communities destroyed, and infrastructure that will take a long time to put together. In fact, the response to, to that catastrophe was phenomenal in that it was led by the hearts of people, which in many instances were much, much bigger than the hearts of their governments. And I think it's for that that we need to look uh, and, and recognize that we have a, a, a beacon of hope. Of course, there are still parts of uh, the countries affected by, by the tsunami that uh, have not yet been reached. In the Horn of Africa, in Somalia, is, are some communities who are quite remote, dependent on fisheries, uh, uh, where, where aid hasn't reached because uh, it's harder for uh, CNN and BBC to get there. Uh, but there are people there, and there are families and communities uh, destroyed there as well. The response uh, uh, to the tsunami has, has truly been phenomenal. Jan Egeland, the uh, UN uh, individual responsible for disaster management says that the response to the tsunami was bigger than all of, all of the other responses uh, in 2004 combined. It says that part of what we need is, uh, are the visual images of, of just what uh, happened in the lives of people. The response of countries, I think, also tells a story. Uh, uh, I think uh, many, many of our our audience here would be Swiss and would be keen to know that uh, per capita, uh, Switzerland's contribution is $3.89 uh, compared to the United States of $1.47. Uh, I don't think President Schmidt of the Confederation in Switzerland has been on TV as often making uh, the statements about how good the hearts of the Swiss people are, but. Uh, I think it's important to understand this uh, in some context. But what's very important is that because we're dealing with the lives of people, you can't calculate it like an actuary calculates uh, for insurance purposes. 
And it's in this context that we need to recognize our collective failures as this generation. We've taken a number of important decisions. Five years ago, uh, in September, uh, uh, heads of state uh, met at the UN and agreed to the Millennium Development Goals. We're far off track. We're supposed to, by 2015, half poverty. We're nowhere near it. In 2002, we met in Monterey and agreed on a basis for partnership. We have the means to monitor the change, but we aren't seeing the resource flows to make a difference in the lives of the poor. And the Millennium Development Goals are so easy. They're so easy we can measure the improvements in the lives of people, but the spending isn't, isn't going in that direction. In fact, you know, because there isn't an intervention on the Millennium Development Goals, we must recognize that every week roughly 300,000 people die from preventable diseases, largely on the African continent and in Southeast Asia. Uh, but the ability of the, the, the leaders of world governments to get together and agree on a big push to make a difference is what this moment is about, and I think that civil society has gathered here uh, must, must raise that voice and ensure that we can deliver on that. The pleading is there. There's a proposal for a Marshall Plan. The Marshall Plan reconstructed Europe after World War II. We need something at least as big to make a difference in the lives of people. And the key challenge is that we need political will to mobilize the resources. Thank you very much. And uh, maybe just very briefly the question that I raised earlier on, you spoke about the need to mobilize people. I noticed this in Davos as well. In the first days of the meeting, we heard a lot about Africa, the fight against poverty, and so on and so forth. But do you really feel that compared with all the promises made in the past, there's a real chance of they being held now? that going to be delivered on these promises? Marcus, you know, the gist of the agreements of Monterey are partnership. It said that we need a contract between North and South. It's a partnership. We in the South need to do certain things, and in response, the North would do, do that. One of the key decisions taken by African heads of state was to form the African Union, a new body that will deal with a number of issues. We launched a new partnership for Africa's development. Again, the center of that is the P, N-E-P-A-D, its partnership. Africa took a big step to launch the African peer review mechanism where <clears throat> there's a panel that does peer reviews on all of the countries. And so the issues of governance would have to be dealt with. In the context of the African Union, peace is very important and we're involved in a number of, 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 of peace initiatives. In fact, democracy is now uh, more the rule than conflict. And it's driving those changes that says that we expect a response. We aren't seeing the aid flows there. We aren't seeing the debt write-offs. And, you know, what uh, Walter Fust and others need to, to understand is that for every uh, Swiss franc uh, uh, that, that goes to an African country by way of donor aid, uh, uh, 50 fenning would flow out um, by way of debt service costs. Uh, so, you know, the money isn't actually leaving the shores. The numbers are distorted. And in the way in which we deal with the Millennium Development Goals, debt write-offs becomes a very, very important issue. We need to ensure that the money can land in countries and make a difference in the lives of people. I know that, that I'm not, I'm, uh, that, you know, in respect of, of uh, development agencies in the main, we're talking exactly the same language. It's governments that we must get to commit and put more money on the table. The 0.7% of GNP was agreed to about 30 years ago. It is part of the Millennium Development Goals, and we must push to ensure that the resources will be there to, to make a substantial and significant improvement in the lives of the poorest of the world's people. Thank you. Thank you, then, uh... Thank you very much. So I now leap towards Afghanistan. Mr. Foreign Minister, Abdullah Abdullah, your country too needs aid very sorely when the country was liberated. 
making this new development possible. There were several conferences. The world agreed that the country should be helped and that Afghanistan needed help and support. But what's the situation now today? There was a lot of mobilization at the time, and everyone agreed that support was necessary. But there seems to be a gap between what was said at the time and what was actually done in practice. So what's the situation like in Afghanistan now in terms of aid? Uh, thank you. In fact, in Tokyo conference in 2002, uh, there were pledges made for Afghanistan for a period of between three to five years' time. Uh, most, to be fair to all, I should say that most of the countries uh, who had made pledges, uh, they have delivered. Uh, and uh, it is a very unique case. Uh, and uh, we are grateful to all of them. Uh, have In some countries have uh, delivered more than they had pledged initially. Having all this said, if you, if you take into account destruction of a country into a period of through a period of 25 years' time, uh, and you uh, calculate the amount pledged in Tokyo, then you'll, you'll get a, a real answer about, about the situation. In the past uh, three years' time, over 2.5 million people have returned back home. 2.5 million people from uh, our refugees have returned back home. Just to resettle two and a half million people in a period of three years' time, how much money will be needed? What's the transportation cost of those people, and so on and so forth? Five million students have gone back to school, uh, boys and girls. Uh, what does it take? So. Uh, in terms of Afghanistan, it is not that the world promised something, but in today they are not delivering. But in the whole contract, which was between the international community of partnership, as uh, my colleague mentioned, uh, we will deliver peace, the Afghans, uh, and democratic process, and reform, and uh, unity of the country, and the world will help us to stand on our own feet. The country has the potential to stand on, our, uh, on its feet. As long as the country needs support, foreign aid, we shouldn't consider, as, as the Afghans and authorities and Afghan citizens, in the international community as our partners, uh, as fulfilling the job to the end. In a country like Afghanistan, which has all potentials for development, the end test would be, does it stand on its own feet or still it needs uh, uh, foreign aid? So it is towards that goal that we are aiming. And I hope that uh, events elsewhere, which needs, requires immediate attention, long-term attention and focus, uh, will not detract uh, the focus from Afghanistan. Well, we've now looked beyond the tsunami. We realize that there are other problems, other difficulties in other regions that need to be seen to. Not only remedy those Dam that damage done by the tsunami, the recent tsunami, that there are other areas where we need to do something. So let's have a change of scene and go to an area where other aid would have to be given and where the first stage may already be completed of the first response so that a longer term planning needs to be set up. And that's the sense of my question to the representative of the International Federation of the Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies, Mr. Marku Niskala. Could you perhaps give us one or two examples 
of uh, where you stand in terms of aid after these first few weeks and first few, or this first month, rather? Um, definitely the first wave of uh, assistance is over in all of those countries, but we still have uh, uh, millions of people actually who are dependent of relief goods, food, water, medical care, and uh, we have a lot of people, enormous amount of people traumatized psychologically. They have lost their families, they need psychological support, uh, if I take an example about fishermen, I think it has been mentioned quite often that fishermen have lost their boats, their fishing nets, their livelihood. But it's not only a question about that. There are many of them, for instance, in Sri Lanka who are saying they lost their wife, they, they lost their family members. They are not anymore willing to go to sea. They, they, they don't just want to fish anymore. They must find something else. And uh, we have uh, hundreds of thousands uh, traumatized families, particularly children actually, who need some uh, adult people to replace the loss of, of their, uh, their parents. So the situation in this regard is, is, is very complicated and uh, from the human point of view, very, very difficult indeed. So psychological support is one of the things which must be taken care of, and uh, we are supporting that as an international federation. But there are a lot of language barriers. We need a lot of people who are talking the, the language of those countries in order to support the people, etc. At this point, the planning of recovery phase in, in full speed, and we want to connect the relief uh, phase to the recovery phase, uh, Red Cross most probably will concentrate very much on health communi at community level and particularly also to take into account, and this is the message we have been putting forward a long time, we must prepare uh, communities better for next probable disasters because whenever the International Red Cross put forward up to now, appeals to improve the disaster preparedness in advance at community level. Those appeals are most unpopular among the governments, for instance. They hardly bring any resources in. But when something happened, the response is really enormous and always actually we're thinking in wrong order. We start from relief to uh, development and actually we should now turn around and, and start speaking from development to relief. And uh, uh, I think this might be a turning point, point in our thinking. Of course the situation in different countries is, is uh, different. Governments actually coordinating the efforts differently in, in Indonesia, Sri Lanka, India and uh, we must paste everything actually at country level and community level. And what we really hope and what is our approach is to involve the people living in communities themselves in planning, because uh, otherwise it's, it's not really going to help them, help them in, on long term. Sie uh, sagen long term. You are saying long term, so with a long view and far-sightedness, that's something that has been said repeatedly. The mobilization was focusing on immediate aid, but the immediate aid has to be given a long-term perspective and be connected to this longer-term planning. But what do you mean with the long-term, uh, for you particularly? How long-term will it be for you? What is the time frame in your plan, regardless of how far you have advanced in such planning? We are, we are counting today that we will stay in, in the area from five to ten years and to assist our particularly national Red Cross, Red Cross and societies to support at community and, and national level. And actually we are also during this period of time building capacities national level 
to, to be better, better prepared. And this is a long-lasting effort, and I think uh, normally Red Cross action is understood to be just in the relief place and relief phase, but uh, the strategy what all national Red Crosses are following actually since early 90s is capacity building, prevention in advance, and that, that actually why we start planning now on long term. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Corinne Honshaw, the aid organization HEKS, I think is mainly present in India in this particular case. Perhaps you could just describe your work to us a little bit. What are the most urgent things you have to see to? So our HEX General Secretary came back yesterday from the field from India and he spoke to me on the phone because of two days so I could have the last information and he said how impressed he was to see the people, especially the fishermen, to see in the state of shock in which they still are almost a month after the tsunami. And he said how these people are still afraid of feeling the earth move or seeing the waves coming up from the sea. So in that context, you can see how, or you can feel probably, how difficult is, it is to think ahead. But it's, it's exactly the role that we have as an NGO, HEX, is to help people in this very difficult situation to try to, to look ahead, to look at tomorrow and to see, okay, how can we go further along? So to come back to the specific question that was asked to me, HEX is active in India, Sri Lanka, and um, Indonesia. What has been done up to now is food and not food item distribution. Some camps had been set up. Post-traumatic counseling has been started because as my colleague from the Swiss, uh, the Red Cross Federation was saying before, and as I was describing with the, the example now of our uh, general secretary, the trauma is there and it has to be dealt with, and also the medical treatment. But we are also dealing with a very difficult and complex political situation in the three countries. And we, if we come back to India, you, you have seen what the Indian government has been saying uh, just after the tsunami, what the Indian government is saying now. And the situation in the field is the following. One day the government is saying A, another day the uh, government is saying B. And in the middle you have the people that need to know, yeah, where are they going? So we are trying as NGO, and not only HEX, but all the, the Swiss NGOs involved in, in India, trying to... Uh, to plan ahead, to hold discussions with the government, central level, uh, local level. We tried to, uh, to, to see how we could go ahead, but the planification, the planning, sorry, of this reconstruction phase is a very complex one, and we have to do it really in depth and thoroughly, because the success of the whole process that comes for the five to next, uh, ten next years is can be guaranteed if this planification stage is really well done. So if I summarize the situation right now, the situation is to, to look, to see what is possible, what is, what is the frame within the NGOs, international, local can work in. And right now, I must say, what is done is to try to help people to, to, uh, to go over what, they, what happened to them and try to, to help them to, uh, to go through this phase where the planning ahead is done. And what I want to say as well is that the, the situation is not easy in the field, neither in India and Sri Lanka, because you have this massive aid that came and, it, and as my, my neighbor said it was very important and very impressive and very touching as well but what you have to see is one village received massive aid and the village next door because it wasn't touched by the tsunami doesn't receive anything then you raise t uh, social tensions and our role as NGOs is also to deal with that and for example in, in Sri Lanka in the camps you have very good uh, medical scheme 
for the first aid medical treatment. And then we are trying to see, okay, what can we do also for the village around so they can also have the same kind of a medical treatment? So just for a quick example. Thanks for your attention. Thank you. Then, uh... Thank you. The Disaster Resource Network in Geneva, it's a network of businesses, of companies, of the private sector that was set up not so long ago and also responded, what is the special role or task of this network? What have you done in this instance? Does it mean disaster network? Does it mean that this is something that really does work in the immediate uh, follow-up after a disaster, or do you also work in the long term, Mr. Bellhaus? Thank you. Um, you're correct. The uh, Disaster Resource Network does work in the continuous process of preparation and response and recovery after a disaster. Uh, you mentioned earlier in your remarks uh, that the history of the DRN is actually from Davos. Um, it was during the annual meeting in 2001 that the Gujarat earthquake occurred in India. And as a consequence of that earthquake, uh, business leaders attempted to provide their resources into the situation. Uh, engineering companies, construction companies, transportation, logistics companies wanted to deploy their resources. And they found that they had not planned for that. They had not established working relationships. They didn't have a protocol. They didn't have a mechanism with which to do that. So the year 2001 to 2002 was used to create those, um, those plans and protocols and procedures. <coughs> And in 2002, at the annual meeting, the Disaster Resource Network was launched, and I'm privileged to serve as the executive director. The purpose of the organization is to encourage and to facilitate the participation by businesses in the continuous process of disaster management. So it's not just about uh, trying to get a company to write a check because a disaster occurred someplace, but it goes much deeper than that. And we typically work at the senior levels within the companies at the board level or the CEO level to try to create a deep level of awareness and a deep level of commitment on the part of that business leader and his corporation or her corporation so that we can begin to build a, a long-standing relationship with them. Um, a year ago, it seems odd that every January or December uh, we have a major a global disaster, but it was one year ago that the BAM earthquake occurred. And uh, one of the lessons that was learned out of that uh, particular experience was that airport congestion was a critical problem. Um, the DRN uh, decided to address that problem, and we spent all of 2004 developing a, uh, a resource that we call the Airport Emergency Team. What that means is we went to the business leaders in Dubai. Uh, in particular, we went to the air transport industry, companies like DHL and TET and, and others, and we asked them to put forth volunteers. We obtained a, a pool of about 60 volunteers who we then trained as a team and equipped them to work in disaster situations. We were going to do our first training mission in February of 2005 but circumstances in Southeast Asia required that we deploy immediately on December 27th. And in fact, we're still operating the Sri Lanka airport today. The, what that means is the businesses not only contributed financially and with goods and services, but they contributed a team of, of knowledgeable people who understood, because of their day-to-day -day occupation, how to operate an airport under high throughput conditions. And uh, I think that there's been remarkable success uh, in the Colombo Airport in moving 7,100 tons of, uh, of material through there in just a few weeks and handling as many as 164 flights in two weeks. So uh, the point here is that uh, it was the expertise that was available in business and it was pre-planning the coordination with the business leaders to, to address a, a well-defined um, need that existed. Now, as we learn from the BAM disaster, we will learn from the Sri Lanka disaster as well. And some of the lessons that are emerging now, certainly is not complete, is that um, 
the economic recovery phase is uh, probably not well addressed. It's left to individual companies, it's left to individual governments, it's left to the multi-lending institutions to uh, go about that business. Uh, we, we think that more can be done to create a coordination, to create a coalition so that the, uh, the economic recovery, uh, and I might add that um, at the end of the day, it's, you know, lives have been lost and there's nothing we can do about that. But, but livelihoods have been lost and we need to go about restoring livelihoods uh, very quickly. So with, with the private sector as the engine of job creation, um, we believe that the DRN needs to continue to be a catalyst and a stimulus for the coordination, uh, multi-sectoral coordination between government, humanitarian organizations, international organizations, and of course the private sector for uh, economic recovery. Uh, is in us. Well, has this become so necessary to have the help of this network in particular? because there is no other organization can do this or because the UN has not had the possibility of setting up the necessary infrastructure so far to see to this basic infrastructure distribution, setting up airports so that they can handle all the traffic, all the goods that have to be moved, because obviously airports are not ready for that kind of situation. They can't cope with that. So there's been a kind of gap in, at the international level for preparedness in the face of such disasters. Teams are simply not available. Is that the case? Well, first, first I would thank you for the question. First, I would comment that uh, certainly DRN is not the only organization that's uh, working in this way. And there are many, many other excellent organizations doing this kind of coordinating work and working with the business sector. Um, the, the question of whether the UN or um, the Red Cross or any other organization should have that capability um, is, is arguable. Um, we think that the uh, skilled resources, people who do a certain type of work every day and therefore are extremely proficient at it, suggests that perhaps we should turn to the private sector uh, and obtain those resources from the private sector by the way, if I, if I wasn't clear about it before, I want to be extremely clear about it now that all of this work that we're talking about, all the support that is provided, is provided without cost. This is totally donated uh, by the private sector. Uh, I think the concept of a pool of experts, whether it be logistics and transportation or some other field, and we're looking at communications, telecommunications, and we're looking at engineering as possible next ventures, um, I think the concept is valid. And one last point is that um, we'll be building several more of these teams this year to cover the world, not just in Dubai. And we also think the concept is scalable. It doesn't have to be just in support of the disasters that hit the front pages of the newspapers like CNN, CNN and so forth. Apologies if there are any CNN cameras here. But also to a smaller scale, uh, it could work on a smaller scale. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, let's turn to Mr. Uwe Durkin and DHL, the Courier Service, and your network. Are you a member of this network that has just been described and presented to us by Mr. Bellhouse, or are you just committed on your own to doing something in the cases of disaster since you are Courier Service and you can provide special services? part of the Disaster Relief Network, which is a network of companies that contribute to the World Economic Forum, but we also do a lot of additional activities over and above uh, our contribution the, to the DRN. Um, the motto of the session today seems to be, uh, when is the economy ethical? Um, and I would like to say for DHL that we have concluded that being ethical, and now with the focus on helping in disaster situations like this, makes good business sense. We are active in more than 220 countries and territories. Um, that makes us the most international organization of the world. There's no other company, no other organization that has a presence uh, like this. Um, we are in, in, there are 40 countries in the world that the State Department describes as dangerous or difficult for various reasons. We are active in every single one. 
Um, and uh, we therefore have a great interest in supporting the communities in all of these 220 countries worldwide. We want to help our customers to be present there, and we want to help our employees to make those countries uh, better places, and particularly to help when disaster strikes. I might add that when it comes to our employees, um, the only thing we actually have to do as managers is to get out of the way when such a thing happens, because DHL has always had this urge among our employees to go out and help when something, um, when a disaster struck. And the only thing we had to do is to tell them that's okay, by the way we help, we support you financially. Um, all our donation projects of employees as a tradition are matched by us, so every employee who gets who puts down 50 uh, francs will be matched by the company with the same amount again. So that's a long tradition, but uh, in, the, in recent years we have organized this a little bit more with organizations like the Disaster Relief Network. And we believe that um, one of the major things we can bring is not so much um, just money, or um, of which there is a lot uh, when a catastrophe hits the headline, but in particular what we have to offer more than any other company in the world, and that is logistics expertise right in those difficult um, geographies where these catastrophes usually happen. There is nobody else who has an organization in, say, Sri Lanka um, that is able to immediately spring into action and um, take over an airport that usually takes a few small planes a day, suddenly gets, um, I don't know, one wide body per hour and, and has no equipment to deal with that. That's the type of thing that we can do well, and that's why we have decided that that is where we should help and give our unique contribution um, to um, the world. Now, um, in the context of the tsunami relief aid, we have uh, also had the advantage of a worldwide organization that can suddenly spring into action at many places at the same time. So in the countries that were struck by the tsunami, we were active in every single one. In Thailand, we delivered over 50 tons of uh, supplies within the first uh, two weeks. In India, we worked with many different uh, um, parties. Um, we contributed blankets, stoves, a lot of kitchen uh, equipment, um, and transported uh, it there. In Sri Lanka, we already talked about this. Uh, in Indonesia, we again did a lot of immediate uh, relief aid and brought in the transportation links. In the Maldives, uh, we were active. But not only this, we also had a lot of programs in, on the other side, in the countries where people were willing to help, and we helped to structure those uh, support efforts. Um, in America, we organized donations uh, from our employees, the same in, uh, in Austria. The Baltic States, um, Estonian hospitals donated uh, medicines that we transported uh, down to the uh, areas in question. Um, in Belgium, our um, national, international headquarters uh, location, we organized a donation effort uh, for the whole world. In uh, Germany, we did a cooperation with eBay, where um, hundreds of thousands of citizens um, cleared out their basements with uh, old um, items they no longer needed, which were put on an eBay auction, and the money was then channeled back uh, into the relief effort. And I could go uh, on and on. In uh, um, almost every part of the world, we had a special relief effort uh, going on. So um, we are lucky that um, in 2004, this relief network had been set up and that we could really virtually push a button or a couple of buttons and get this uh, uh, whole initiative uh, rolled out. Other than this particular area, we are also active in many other areas to help uh, uh, our economies and help the world. We have a digital divide initiative at the World Economic Forum. Our role is to transport uh, computers that the computer industry is donating to areas where educational efforts are sponsored with them, for example, to universities in, in Africa. Um, there are, uh, there's the so-called World Health Initiative, where again our activity is the logistics on the ground. For example, the distribution of um, drugs against uh, retroviral uh, rival, viral diseases like uh, HIV AIDS, uh, which are donated by the pharma companies, transported and distributed by us to um, patients in uh, sub-Saharan African countries. Um, there is a malaria relief program where we are donating and transporting um, malaria um, uh, um, uh, um, mosquito nets which are impregnated with insecticides to help people in sub-Saharan Africa to avoid uh, malaria. There are a lot of environmental programs, so a whole package uh, of issues. Um, but what I can tell you today is with great conviction, um, these activities 
um, are, in my opinion, uh, not only good for the world, but also good uh, for the company. We think that a modern multinational company should be active in corporate citizenship activities. We believe in it, we support it, and we invite our colleagues uh, to be there with us. And the DRN is an example of a whole large group of companies in the World Economic Forum who have jointly um, come together to help in uh, situations like the tsunami relief effort. Uh, Mrs. Ogata, Japan. Japan. Responded particularly generously to the UN appeal. I was at the UN donor conference in Geneva where very many countries made generous pledges and also gave proof of the millions that they were going to donate. And I there, was there, of course, as a journalist. And we journalists wanted to find out what the breakdown was. And at the beginning of the year, Japan was the country which had pledged and already paid up $750 million. That was one third of the total. Now, in the past few days, I have looked into the question in general, the Millennium Development Goals, uh, aid in general, and we know that a lot is said about the development aid granted and provided by countries, that some countries should do more, but Japan is one of the countries that, compared with its economic clout, and power is not ranked first. So how can one understand or explain this generous reaction? Is it because it's the 10th anniversary of the Kobe earthquake and your country knows what it means to go through a disaster and feels particularly affected? What other reasons might there be? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, you explained all the financial parts, so I don't have to say those things. But you see, Japan is very much a natural disaster prone country. We have lots of typhoons, it was a very severe earthquake this summer, and tidal wave known as tsunami. Tsunami is a Japanese word that became international word. So these things are very real to, I would say, an average Japanese because it's something we have to live with. And so when the, uh, the uh, uh, Sumatra, uh, the Indian Ocean um, tidal wave hit the news on the 26th of December, the um, uh, Japan disaster relief teams were leaving Narita the next morning. And I am very proud of the speed with which we could act. JICA is my, uh, my office, the Japan International Cooperation Agency, uh, manages this uh, Japan disaster relief teams. They, we are the secretariat. We have teams always on standby. And we can call on doctors, nurses, and maybe if whatever is necessary uh, to go to the spot very, very fast. And from the 27th on, we sent uh, teams to uh, Sri Lanka, then to Thailand, then to uh, Indonesia, and a small team just to check on Maldives and so on. And, and already, and they set up camps, uh, they, uh, uh, camp type hospitals, usually dealing with uh, t treating with those who are in medical need already, and usually two weeks they turn. So we, they're already in the third teams that have come back. And this is something that is happening. And so, but what I'd like to, to talk a little bit more is about how can you deal with disa natural disaster reduction? You cannot stop natural disasters from happening. I'm afraid not yet. But you can certainly reduce the impact. And this is what we, we are discussing on the one hand, reduce the impact of the seismic uh, 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 happenings. And so there is a warning system centered in Hawaii that has been covering the, um, the Pacific Ocean, but had not covered yet the Indian Ocean. 
So the first thing that has been agreed internationally, and the, fortunately there was a Kobe uh, earth, earthquake uh, 10th anniversary and a natural disaster conference planned. And this uh, came in uh, in January, uh, and this was a good occasion to to um, exchange views on how to spread the coverage of the uh, early warning system about seismic uh, occurrences and tsunami as well. So this is going to be set up. Several agencies are going in, into, uh, and to, it will probably take about two years to really get the Indian Ocean covered. But then there are other things that have to be done. You, in, in Japan itself, if there is an earthquake somewhere, within about three minutes, the information spreads. It has come to that point. But the most important thing to realize is that it's not sufficient for the information to reach the central government or the, uh, uh, the, the central office. It has to spread through the country and to the local people. And this information against disaster dissemination system is going to take a little longer to set up. But this is one of the things that uh, I think Japan and my office would be very much helping this, to de develop local information dissemination system warning, whether it's earthquake, tsunami, landslides, or whatever. And then, so that the people know what to do, where to evacuate, this will take more time to really seep into the local communities. And already, uh, we have, uh, the, Prime, the Prime Minister of Japan has asked us to really bring in experts from the various countries affected by the tsunami to come and be trained. On the other hand, on the ground, aside from the uh, emergency relief teams that have been working, uh, we, uh, we have already sent um, project formation teams to study what to do about recovery and reconstruction. They are now, uh, for about a month, both in uh, Sri Lanka and Indonesia, they're examining what to be done. I think this, uh, from the information that I have received, uh, they will be examined, looking into especially uh, the, the fishing villages have been badly done because they are all along the coast. So the fishing villages recovery, which is really linked to poverty reduction strategy that we're all uh, in nowadays. So looking at how to restore the fishing villages, their livelihood, of course there's a shelter problem, maybe road problems, road repair, and water supply systems and things like that. So we are, at the same time, from the very beginning, we decided to see what kind of a follow-up development work has to be done. So I'm very, at least, uh, glad that these things are being followed up in, by the middle of next month. I think we would be getting reports on what to do, as well as starting to work on some of them. Repair, restoring some of the hospitals would be very important, because no country wants to rely on other countries' emergency teams for their health needs. Just to give you an example, this year also, about the time that this particular tsunami incident took place, it was one year anniversary of the Iran bomb uh, earthquake. And we also, Jack, sent the emergency relief teams. They stayed on a little bit longer than usual to help set up a, a hospital system that for, the, for Iran to carry out. And then it took almost a year, we're just finishing, restore the water supply system. So out of these natural disasters, aid agencies can move in and help um, uh, restore or even develop situations in a way that would prevent the recurrence of uh, disasters from hitting these places. I don't think we should, poverty reduction means when we restore uh, or reconstruct areas, it will be the kind of restoration that the same poverty stricken areas would be, would remain poverty stricken. So I think there's a lot of development work that will go into the after effects of this very, very serious, large tsunami disaster that took place in the Indian Ocean countries. Um, you said something about why are you doing this for tsunami but not enough money given to development assistance. In volume terms, it's quite large. It's probably still, it's going down and that upsets me a great deal. But I think this, the budget 
for development, the official development assistance, is linked with the fiscal condition of a government. And since the conditions are not good, it is, a, it is going down. In absolute terms, it is still quite high, probably the second in the world. But in terms of uh, ratio to the GNP, it is small because the GNP is large. And I would like to see uh, Japan someday reaching the 0.7%, but that will be a long, long time to go. But I'd like to see much more improvement from the current 2.2 or something like that to at least uh, something better. But I won't quote figures because I don't know how to reach there. Thank you. Uh, Walter Fust. Walter Fust, you also attended this conference in Geneva that I mentioned very briefly, this donor conference where the main purpose was to coordinate donations and help and aid, where these very large pledges were made under the auspices of the UN. And a discussion was also held about how one was to proceed, to learn from lessons in the past, from mistakes of the past, how to coordinate all the finance, the money. So what needs to be done immediately. We also spoke about BAM and the earthquake there. In the case of BAM, there was a very wide gap between the pledges made and what then actually was done in practice. Uh, to manage a crisis is substantially easier than to manage the normal. As it is unverhältnismäßig. It is immeasurably easier to manage a crisis than to manage reality. Just to take this as a statement before I continue, even though most people will think that it's exactly the opposite, that it's easier to manage reality and, and everyday life than the crisis. But now we are moving towards real life, which is terrible for very many people in these areas, but perhaps also with some hope for those who see the silver lining. What have we learned then from past disasters? I believe that it is mainly the response time, that's to say the time it takes to put into motion the very unwieldy machinery, the international machinery, this time worked very smoothly even though it was at Christmas time. But it worked very well simply because, well, it worked well despite the fact that the information about the real extent of the disaster was very uh, lacking at the beginning. We simply saw that the international authorities have to react much more quickly. It's good if aid can come in from abroad very soon, very rapidly, but it is just as necessary for the national authorities to be prepared to receive all this aid from abroad. And this time around, we saw that this preparation, this preparedness was simply not there when we should have really have expected it to be there. But we have to take into account, of course, that the extent of the destruction and the disaster varied quite cons considerably depending on where it struck most or less. It was immeasurably more difficult to organize everything in the north of Indonesia, in Sumatra, where the disaster was worst, or in Thailand or in Sri Lanka. We've also learned that disasters bear in themselves a seed for the peace process. I still don't dare hope that this is the case in Sri Lanka. Even though I spent very little time there, I became very much aware of the fact that the rebels would have liked to renewed talks with the government, but that very it took very little 
for these talks to founder again. And then in Sumatra as well, there is a very delicate situation which may be in the background now, but may very much come into the foreground again in the near future. But what we learned or what we were taught in this disaster is that international solidarity is possible in the wake of this terrible disaster on condition that conflicts do not burst out here and there because of certain parties wanting to take control of the resources that are being provided, the aid that is being provided. But I really wonder whether the international wave of solidarity would have been so high had this disaster struck to the same extent in Africa. I'm just trying to say that many Europeans simply have a different kind of relationship to Asia than they do or would have to other parts of the world. But I really would like to underline here that in addition to everything else, the wave of solidarity has shown that citizens all over the world seem to be far ahead of their governments. And here I agree entirely with my neighbor, with the finance minister of South Africa. He's expressed a very typical Swiss understatement. The per capita aid is $3.8, but in fact it is $25, and that is regardless of age and, and, and social category. And perhaps it is much easier to grant a debt exemption rather than finding a parliamentary majority in favor of a decision. What I've learned in the last 10 years of disaster relief and aid is that we need a, an, an official international system of accountability so that those who make pledges internationally in the case of a disaster actually deliver. Governments cannot just make pledges and then not give the money that they have promised or suddenly use it elsewhere or simply take it to make a settlement of bills or invoices of military material being provided. So I'm very much in favor of such a system, international system of accountability. In fact, such a system is being prepared and I can only hope that this will help to make politicians a little more committed and keep in their minds that they should be active at all times and not only show a bit of solidarity in the case of a disaster. A little bit being done all the time can go very far. Thank you. Yes, now, we'd like to turn to you, the floor, the people in the audience, and ask you whether you have any questions. When you do take the floor, please give your name or whom you represent and to whom you're addressing your question and ask for the microphone. It will be brought to you. Dr. Albanna from My name is Dr. Albanna, President of Islamic Cliff uh, UK. We have two operations in Banda Aceh as well as in uh, Ambara and uh, in Gol in Sri Lanka. The first question was about the first phase, which was still facing the first phase particularly in Banda Acha and in Ambara, because psychological counseling is not a long term. At this stage, it is still an acute phase. People cannot go and work in this area because of the tremor they are feeling every day and night in this area. Job creation is uh, extremely difficult because of the destruction of the ports itself. People are so afraid to live on Earth, and they're so frightened to go back to the seaside, particularly if they are fishermen. So I think the first phase is still going on for about at least two to three months if we start acute psychological counseling in this area. If we talk about uh, uh, the clearing of the wreckage, what we see on television, we saw the main roads of Banda Aceh, because I was there at the beginning of the month for two weeks. 
And what we see in the, in the side uh, of the roads or in the villages, still the records are intact. And we, 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 we used to smell the smell of death underneath this wreckage. The fear in this area is a spread of epidemics. Children are playing in this wreckage. It's insects, rats, and others in this area. So it's a really very, very difficult situation. And particularly in the country with like uh, uh, Indonesia, they are facing a huge problem because of there is no infrastructure in the area. Roads have been destroyed. The airports have been congested. They have not been prepared. The world has not been prepared for the tsunami. So we cannot actually put all the pressure on the people in this, in this area. There's a cultural issue as well. The widowed woman in this area, by their culture, particularly the Muslim widowed woman, which is the majority of them are Muslims, could not be able to go outside the house for at least a period of three months. And you can imagine, in this area, the woman cannot find a job, even if you provide her for a job, because this is a traditional custom in the woman in this area. Islam did not say this, but actually this is a tradition and the cultural tradition. Other point which I'd like also to share with you is the children. The children uh, smuggling, which happened, unfortunately. We need to understand the culture of the people in Banda Aceh. Banda Aceh has been considered to the central government of Indonesia as a conservative, very conservative, and the clash between the people in Banda Aceh and the government was actually on the conservative Islam. I read with my own eyes when I was leaving the airport of, of, uh, of Banda Aceh, do not take our children away. There was a report by, New, uh, by uh, Washington Post two weeks ago about 300 children has been taken. This made a big problem for the central government in Jakarta as well as the local uh, groups in this area. The local groups are really could be very excited to actually to start some anti, what do you call it in uh, proper uh, soft language, uh, like terrorist activity, unfortunately, because of the abduction or what you can see that some of the agencies are taking the children. So the, culture, the, the cultural problem has to be understood by the international agencies in this area uh, as well. So to, to, to sum up what I'm trying to say, I think we're going to stay in Banda Aceh as well as in uh, Ambara for a long period of time. And this is time that actually psychological counseling is an acute as well as chronic uh, phase. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. There's a hand at the back of the room. There you go. Martin Brim from Germany. I have two questions. One to the representative of the governments first. We spoke about insufficient infrastructures at the governmental level. Do you think that this is also due to the fact that internationally active companies try to evade taxes wherever they can? And Mr. Bellhouse, do you think that the companies here at Davos would be willing to pay taxes to allow and enable governments to provide the kind of aid that is necessary to survive in the first period after a disaster and also to make the necessary investment in preventing disasters of the tsunami. Any further questions? Federal Institute for Snow and Avalanche Research here in Davos. Thank you for your comments. Um, during the discussions at the Congress, has, has there been talk of pre-event uh, solidarity financing possibilities so that countries can recover from disasters sustainably. There seems to be quite a focus on aid and emergency recovery, but what kind of actions, partnerships, involvement of the private sector, possibly in partnership with the public sector, what kind of plans have been discussed this week or in other forums to discuss pre-event financing or longer term non-aid or what I mean by that is non-emergency aid um, disaster response. Uh, is your question to a specific person? To the panel. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Is there any other frage? Any further questions? And then we'd answer them. I'm Roland Anon. 
I usually spend my holiday here in Davos and uh, have a habit of coming to the open forum meetings. We still have about 30 minutes left, and I simply feel that we haven't heard very much about the topic, what is human life worth? No questions have been put, nor any answers given. Ambassador Fust did touch upon it, I think. In the case of the genocide in Rwanda, why only 30 million was provided in aid and why only 3 million was given when there was the volcanic eruption in Africa as well and why so much is now being given for the uh, victims of the tsunami. So I'm putting this question, why, how do you explain this? Thank you. Perhaps you could respond to the question put a moment ago. What is being done specifically? If there are any projects, who would like to take that question? Uh, thank you very much. The, let, let me try and deal with, with all of them. The first question is about taxation. Now, clearly, there's a, there's a huge problem because countries in the south raise too little by way of taxation. One of the reasons for that is, of course, that uh, many of the companies operating in developing countries are globalized uh, companies. They tend to pay tax where they're headquartered. Um, and so there's very little that remains, and at the end of the day, people are too poor. The huge difficulty about institutions, and a lot of these issues are being discussed uh, in the Congress all year, a lot of the difficulties are a result of, of, you start with poverty. You therefore have difficulty in building the necessary skills capability within government to do a series of uh, things. To build the institutions, to provide the good quality services, services that uh, many people in developed countries take for granted, um, too poor to collect taxes, and it's just a horrible downward spiral. Key issue is, of course, a different debate in terms of globalization, who wins and who loses, and how we can intervene uh, to address those issues, because measurably, the lives of people in poor countries uh, is, is becoming uh, poorer. In respect of prevent financing, and, and this is where, I, you know, uh, uh, Marcus, my, my, my understanding is we're using the tsunami to talk about the issues that Mr. Non wants us to talk about. What is human life worth? The silent tsunamis that are hitting, that are killing people every single day. I used the figure of 300,000 people a week who die uh, as a result of diseases that can well be prevented. And these are basic things. What do we do about malaria? What do we do about HIV and AIDS? How do we prevent uh, maternal uh, uh, mortality or infant uh, mortality. What are the things that we must do? How do we go about providing water and sanitation? And the question about pre-event financing is in fact this issue. The Millennium Development Goals and the big appeal for resources for the Millennium Development Goals is, is one that needs to go public and, and part of what, what I believe we need to do is to take forward a spirit that says, let's not depend on governments, let's embarrass governments if they are too parsimonious in their conduct. Now, we need, we need a bigger campaign than what we have at the moment. Uh, in uh, a discussion I was yesterday, a few ideas were raised. You see, the value system of society is, is a bit distorted. We turn on our televisions and we see share prices flashing across the bottom of the screen. Why don't we use that space to tell families what is happening in respect of underdevelopment? Why don't we tell families every day how many more people need water and sanitation, how little money has been ra raised for the Millennium Development Goals? Why don't we take this as topics for discussion around tables when families sit to eat so that we can give the campaign for development a much bigger push? It's these kinds of things that need to change so that we take collective responsibility for what remains undone in society at this point in time. And of course, uh, in respect of what Mr. Roland and Non raises, I agree entirely. We must use the opportunity. At first, 
I wondered, why is it that so much money is going there? And uh, I realized then that community pressure can make a difference. But we need the visual images to tell people what needs to be done, because I think that there's enough goodwill. In the same way as uh, when, in October, uh, the, the Paris Club, the rich countries, decided to write off uh, uh, all of Iraq's debt, I was a bit struck by this. Because for a long time, as Africans, we've been battling for debt relief. The fact of the matter is that Iraq is neither poor, it doesn't carry, uh, qualify as a highly indebted poor country. It has tons of oil reserves. Why was there debt relief for Iraq? And so, you know, at first I was a bit struck, but now I think that we're in a position to deal with the forked tongues to say, why not more debt relief? Because in fact, by that single decision of the Paris Club on that single day in October, more debt relief was given to one country that isn't sufficiently poor than hitherto in the past eight years by way of debt relief to all of the really poor countries. These are the challenges. This is the pre-event financing. This is the response that the world needs. This is the avoiding the silent tsunamis. Thank you very much, Marcus. Uh, Mrs. Ogata, some examples were just given. The fact that much more was donated this time around than in the case of Rwanda and other disasters in Africa. And I'm sure you experienced this yourself when you were at the, at the High Commissariat. you must have experienced how difficult it is to even get to raise money. So can you explain why there is such an imbalance? Why does one thing count more than the other? You see, this, uh, the um, Indian Ocean tsunami disaster just proved the fragility of human life. All of a sudden, on the same beach, people living, playing, just over, o overturned in a dramatic way. And that, I think, was a shock. And a lot of people saw it on television. And, and that shock itself was triggered a response. That's one of the things. But let me, if there's the question of the Rwanda uh, genocide was raised. You know, Rwanda, there was genocide as after it was understood, did cause some shock. There were some 800,000 people killed. But the re refugee situation of, in Rwanda was 30 years old. And if uh, being a, rage, uh, a refugee agency, we tried to get some settlement. We tried to get some assistance. Very little response. And at least in Kigali, there was civil war from 91. It should, everything you, could have been expected. But man-made disasters trigger much less spontaneous response. That's my experience. Natural disasters get much more quick response, whether it was in, uh, in all these, uh, uh, I mean, in uh, Mozambique, when it was a very big flood and all that, we got much more response. Same in various uh, typhoon, tsunami type thing. It is easier. I would say maybe I'm a little bit cynical. Governments don't have to worry on which side they are on. Uh, with regard to natural disasters. Everybody can help. But when it gets to man-made conflict, every assistance have a political meaning. And so therefore, they do tend to be much, much less involved because they don't want to take sides so clearly. And I think this is one of the problems that is very different dealing with natural disasters, as I had to do now this time, and with all the Rwandas and all the Balkans and so on that I had a very hard time. I remember in Afghanistan, I went there the last time during the Taliban days in 2000. Only thing I wanted to get was raise $1 million because there was so little assistance for the refugees coming in to uh, Iran and also to uh, Pakistan. And with another million, I, there were some people who, in spite of everything, wanted to go back. I could not raise that. See, these are the realities. Political ones are harder to raise money. 
natural disasters, whether you say fortunately or unfortunately, that's up to you. But this particular one, in that sense, was brought in an outflow of people who maybe felt bad not having done enough in many ways. There was an outpour. And what is important is to make the most out of the, the sympathies and the so on that is coming out. And there is a division of work that we have. Uh, the UN humanitarian agencies have people on the ground, so they're doing the food and the meat and the care about uh, uh, child traffic and also those things were all talked about. And I hope, since more people are aware and they can talk more openly a little bit over natural disasters, that things would be done better. I think that the, if I could just, I don't want to talk too much, but anyway, for the outside international agencies, there are certain things they can do or we can do in emergencies. But the real important thing is to link up with the people there. And there is the cultural issue, the, the, the trauma issues, the culture. Is, they can really, Im most important work will come from with the local NGOs or local people and how to organize and tie and link up with them. And that is the real test. Thank you. Walter Fuss, möchte auch noch zu Walter Fuss, you would like to come in on that as well? With the microphone, please. The microphone is not working. Thank you. ...is really to engage local manpower for rehabilitation and reconstruction work. And not that the big companies are coming in ready-made uh, and uh, with huge prices paid. It needs an injection of uh, purchasing power into the local economy to give a sustainable basis for a livelihood. That we take into account the cultural context is for sure important. I agree with you, we have to really keep an eye that uh, child trafficking, women trafficking is not on the increase. It happened, unfortunately. But UNICEF is uh, strongly involved in that and we support all those endeavors. The Indonesian government requested also to give support to train policemen uh, and police women in order to prevent such activities. The same uh, is in Sri Lanka. To the Strukturen Regarding the structures, infrastructures, the governments and the private sectors and the companies here in, in Davos, I think it's important to see and underline the complementarity. There are some things that UN agencies can do either multilaterally or bilaterally, depending on the type of the task to be accomplished. They can do it better and faster. The DHL experience or experiment is a very fascinating one. I, it was fabulous to see what was done there, and congratulations. But you cannot um, ask businesses to be involved for three months uh, free of cost in, in, in this way. We have the core of humanitarian aid of the army in Switzerland, which is a kind of a, an organization for immediate disaster relief. This is a body that we can mobilize and call up within a very short period of time, and companies then release their employees. They are compensated for this, and we have lots of companies with whom we have this kind of labor contract. We found that this is a very, very rapid response system, and we can make available this force, this labor force, to UN agencies if necessary. What has impressed me most here in Davos is not only the personal contacts, but that is the result of the decision taken by the citizens here. For a whole evening, the citizens in assembly had to discuss the major challenges of world leaders have nowadays, whether it is in science, in politics, in the economy, and so on and so forth. And the following ranking was given by the citizens having discussed this, if I may uh, say so. Poverty comes first. 64% of citizens rank that first. Secondly, a more balanced globalization, 53% was ranking this second. Climate change, 53%. Education, 49 percent. Solution to the Mideast conflict, 43 percent. A global, better global governance, 43 percent. 
Of course, world trade is important as well, but they only came 13th. I think this proves that there is a rethinking, a change in mentality also in the minds of the leaders. They seem to realize that business alone will not solve all the problems, but these problems cannot be solved without the help of such good companies, good businesses who can provide their contribution from the private sector. And that was a real eye-opener for me. Thank you. Uh, Perhaps Mr. Durkin could also go into what is at all feasible against the backdrop mentioned and described by Mr. Fust. Now, if poverty comes so high up in the ranking, comes first, in fact, what do you think should be done so that poverty could kind of slip down in the ranking? And then I will also begin the final round. If you could also respond to the question put about what is human life worth? Um, I'd like to give a brief overview of things that will be happening out of the World Economic Forum and its member companies in the coming months that are answering some of the issues that some of you brought up. Um, obviously, more medicines will be sent, which will deal with questions like epidemics, though the real problem, as you rightfully said, is how to get them there more than um, whether to have them. I've seen the last satellite photos of the northern tip of Banda Aceh, and it's really shocking. There's a volcano on the very north uh, end that has more or less been circumvented by water now from the tsunami. There are big uh, pools that have been created, lakes that have been created by the tsunami that are still full of uh, dead bodies. I mean, we just have estimates of tens of thousands of dead bodies in these pools. That, that's where the most people uh, have died. And it's really, really shocking. By the way, the satellite pictures are necessary because it's the only way to even survey this area. You can see on those pictures that the bridges uh, are, have become waterfalls and have been uh, broken. So it is still a very difficult situation. Uh, you mentioned trauma healing. There is a, a trauma healing organization that is, at, as we speak, going down to Sri Lanka and Indonesia to um, heal the trauma of the helpers. Traumahealing.com is their website, if you uh, don't know them. Um, and we are helping with tickets and with uh, transportation for those people who have this practice of being trauma healers uh, in many previous uh, catastrophes as well. Um, we were asked here uh, what to do uh, about uh, taxes. There is an um, activity um, to purge uh, corruption among World Economic Forum companies, a commitment by uh, the World Economic Forum companies not to allow corruption. Um, and that is an important element generally for business. Having said that, let me also point out that the key financial problem here is not the tax receipts from international companies in those economies. Like in our economies, most of the tax money is not even is not coming from companies, let alone from international companies. Most tax money in those countries that have a solid tax base uh, comes from transactions and from the citizens at large. The problem in many of the countries we are talking about here, unfortunately, is that they don't have property rights, as was uh, properly pointed out today in a discussion by, among others, uh, Mr. Yavlinsky, Mr. De Soto. Um, and before we have that, we can't even really talk of a functioning um, tax system for these governments. So there's a long political process to run through, is my point, uh, until we have functioning systems that can produce better infrastructures in these countries. Um, Pre-financing, um, there is um, a lot of uh, foundation money available in the world, plus the spontaneous help when the catastrophe strikes, that usually makes sure these days that the financing of relief efforts is not our first um, problem. And even though it's very important that this awareness is here now, the scarce resource is often uh, elsewhere. I would argue that uh, with the amount of money that is currently rolling in for the tsunami, there is probably danger that in some areas we will overinvest. We will have money and we'll do things that on balance uh, are not uh, uh, optimal. Um, so if you want to contribute um, uh, in a big way because you feel strongly about uh, such a, uh, an event, Think about going yourself and giving your skill, your particular um, added value that you can provide, um, because things like logistics, like medical service, like organization are often harder to come by, plus people who are willing to put themselves out there in, in situations like this, than uh, the cool hard cash, which is coming in. 
Um, and uh, um, it's in, in this spirit that I would uh, uh, like to uh, thank you um, for all the efforts that you have made uh, to help in this catastrophe and um, to ensure you that the companies um, that represent the World Economic Forum are doing their best to contribute their skills um, to lighten the burden for the people who have been hit by this. Uh, then would I not so May I also ask um, Marco Niskala something about this uh, imbalance, this lack of balance? How do you handle it? Is it also the case for you that you have a lot of money in some countries and then lacking funds in others? You cannot, of course, value human life differently from one region to another, but this is obviously a dilemma for you too. Or can you remedy this? Unfortunately, this is the case today. But uh, as I feel the outpouring of compassion after tsunami might uh, be a turning point in aid giving and development aid. Uh, let's hope, for instance, that the government would, uh, governments would agree that they will consolidate all the aid they will offering in 2005, including for the tsunamis as their new benchmark for progress towards the 0 0.7 CDP target. This would accelerate, we would have a new starting point for development aid for 2006, which would really accelerate the work towards HIV, AIDS globally, uh, for Darfur, for hurricane crisis in Caribbean, etc. So Tsumani might play a big role for governments and for humanitarian organizations and also for the Red Cross. I also would like to thank for all the, all the support and good cooperation from Davos, from the private sector, governments and, and particularly the general public. <coughs> thank you. Well, the question to you too, Corinne Ancho, you also have to deal with this question. Probably just now you have quite a lot of funding. The chain of happiness also collected money for other things. The first one is to um, the general director of DHL. HEX is active in more than 30 countries. I've never seen, seen the work of DHL, so I'm not going to comment on it. But what I want to say, in the countries where HEX is working, there is people with capabilities, with know-how, and we have to support the people that live in the countries concerned. It's the way you create job, it's the way you create wealth. So I will appeal exactly in the other, exactly the other position as the director of DHL. Don't go there. There is capabilities in Sri Lanka, in Indonesia, in Thailand, and everywhere else. Secondly, I would like to say that for us, uh, Hex, when I left the office, and I'm sorry to be personal, but I think it's important, when I left the office on the 24th of December, I thought, my God, the situation in Kivu, Republic Democratic of Congo, in Goma, we just got a few phone calls and emails of our coordinator in Goma, and he was saying, look, you have to do something about the IDPs around Goma. There are more than 200 people there. And I left yeah, the work, the office thinking, yeah, how are we going to do that? Something will certainly happen over Christmas. And then when I saw the news on the 26th, okay, I just start working, I'm there for that. But then when I came back to, uh, to the office, and then I saw, okay, we don't, we don't have the money available, but we're still trying to, uh, to, to raise it. But what I want to say with that is every life has exactly the same worth. And the tsunami, and if you allow me this maybe bad expression, we surf yeah, now on the wave. What we are doing, we are trying to explain to our constituencies, to our donors, 
What's happening in Asia is awful, very important. There, there is money available. We're going to do a good work within the five, ten years. We're going to be there. But don't forget Haiti. Don't forget Congo. Don't forget Palestine. And the list is very long. And I can assure you, and I think it's the role of the NGOs, I can assure you it works. The people do understand. And as I'm sure most of you here do understand that. So I think the tsunami is also for us the opportunity as NGOs to remember our role in the society as member of the Savile Society to, to increase the awareness of the public about all these forgotten um, uh, catastrophes. And I think we will succeed, I'm, I'm convinced. Um, Mr. Abdullah Abdullah. Mr. Abdullah Abdullah, Mrs. Anshaw, Mrs. Anshaw has just named certain countries, Haiti, Congo, and other countries. You represent Afghanistan. You have just heard that there is some money available for some countries, more here, less there. How would you place yourself in, in this uh, range? Uh, first of all, it is extremely important, not only uh, from the recipient point of view, but also from the donor's point of view, as well as the citizens of the world who are willing to help in different parts of the, uh, 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 our, our, our world, that once there is a commitment, it has to be completed. Uh, I like very much the idea of international system of accountability uh, when it comes to emergency assistances. Uh, if two years down the road we, we find out that those countries which, made, which have made big pledges, they have not delivered, it's a failure. It has to be treated as a case study. When there was pledges for reconstruction of Afghanistan, if three years down the road, from now on, three years already passed, you go to Kabul and we, you still don't see electricity uh, on, on permanent base in the capital of that country, uh, it, you should ask yourselves, as well as the, 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 the governments, uh, what is happening? So when there is, when there is a case, it has to be completed. And the people, the citizens of the world, which have shown their power, for example, in the tsunami case, they were the first to, to, to respond. Uh, they should take the governments, the agencies accountable for, for their actions. If, the, if, if the, uh, uh, the success could be tested against a few criteria, if the children uh, in Bande Aceh, I, I, I name one example, uh, go to school, and the parents uh, go to work, uh, that should be uh, the, the criteria of success uh, uh, for, for all of us which are making efforts in that regard. So issue of debt relief, uh, it has been talked about, there is a consensus among all citizens, citizens of the world, you should use your, uh, your power and in, in, in enforce it upon your governments that while there is such, a, such an urgency to that, while there is such a, such a need for that, uh, what should we do with it? What, whether we continue talking about it years and years and years without uh, taking the steps. Then about silent tsunamis, I think uh, we shouldn't forget the power of media. Is there a way that we can get media interested in those cases? It is human life. Uh, is there anybody here can, who can put a price on a single human life on the face of the earth? So uh, human life numbers, my colleagues talked about it, uh, and is still uh, uh, the responses as we see. So it is, it is a change of attitude which is needed. It's a change of mentality which is needed, and it is uh, uh, the use of the power of the people uh, which has to be uh, utilized in a focused manner in order to see results everywhere uh, in, in, in all those areas which the people are concerned about it. Thank you very much. Um, time is marching on. I'm sure there's a lot that could still be discussed, but I would like, I would like to conclude in the following way. As Mr. Fust has said, 
on the first day uh, of the forum, it was stated that poverty really comes first, and all sorts of statements were made by various eminent political leaders, President Chirac, the Prime Minister of the UK, uh, Tony Blair, who both said that Africa is very high on the list and that poverty has to be combated. So we now just have to wait and see whether this will remain a dead letter or whether something really practical will be done. I hope that we will not in the future say that Africa was just on the agenda of the forum this year, but that something actually was done. So anyway, thank you very much for having attended this meeting and I hope to see you again at a next debate. Just a reminder, please don't forget to complete the pink form and give it when you leave the room. Thank you very much to everyone and see you soon.